So I think now from the retina we move uh, up ahead to the cornea. So we've uh, started from, from behind the eye, we've started with the optic nerve, the orbit, the retina, and now we move to the front, which is basically the cornea, the corneosclera. And I think this is probably, so whenever one thinks in terms of trauma, probably one of the most common things one thinks of is corneal perforations. And the burden of trauma usually, uh, you know, uh, it's the young males or children who are the most commonly affected. Uh, a very common part of most of the traumas will end up with a corneal perforations or basically penetrating injuries of the globe or perforations of the cornea. We're using the term separately because penetration is referring to just an entry and perforation is through and through. But when we say corneal perforation, we're referring to uh, uh, the whole cornea being uh, passed through and through. But uh, there is a, a big vision uh, loss problem that often happens in these people and therefore uh, th this is a big burden on everybody. And the, it's an important thing that you have to look at the clinical history which is very, very important whenever you get it and you need to know from when, at what point in time did this happen, uh, what was the injury with, what has been the course after that, has the patient received any treatment. And apart from, of course, and you need to sometimes take history such as has he had a tetanus toxoid in the past in any cases of trauma. So these are general basic histories that you must take. The point, the time of the injury, the, uh, with what the injury has happened, the mode of the injury, these are very, very important. And of course, when we do examine, we'll come to some more points there. But one has to be sure that the, it's, it's not just the eye and it's not just something else that's happening in the body. For example, if there has been a trauma or a polytrauma, one has to always look at is there anything else life-threatening which is happening? So one cannot be myoping and just look at the eye, especially if somebody comes into your clinic. But very often, uh, sometimes a lot of the injuries which are involving just the cornea are going to be involving some of the other systems in the eye, and therefore one has to always do a comprehensive evaluation for that as well. In terms of examination, it's important to see where the injury is, and I think for that I'm just going to move a couple of slides ahead. This is the important classification that Dr. Varun also has referred to. You need to see where exactly the injury is, what is the type of injury that is there, the vision and the pupillary responses. So this gives you an idea of the prognosis of the case. So in any examination, whenever you're doing, just at least try to have a look at these basic elements or these basic points that should be there. And it's important to do some documentation of the history as well and the examination. And if you have a clinical photography system, it's a good idea to take a photograph of that particular eye before you go in to operate. And always discuss with the patient what is going to happen, what is the kind of outcome that that patient is expecting. So these things are important. And in terms of imaging, when we come, when we look at it, the uh, it is important to always think in terms of a possible foreign body in the eye or a retained intraocular foreign body in the eye. And as Dr. Varun said, one of the important investigations is the ultrasound, but you will not be doing an ultrasound in case there is a corneal perforation. You always wait to repair it because you're going to actually put some pressure on the globe which may you know, cause the intraocular contents to come out. So therefore, the X-ray of the orbits is a good idea if you're thinking in terms of metallic or a CT scan if you're thinking in, uh, in terms of something non-metallic. But it will give you an idea if there is an intraocular foreign body or not. And that's something that one needs to note in the beginning when you one goes in for the case. And a lot of times, of course, it's uh, clearly visible what has caused the uh, injury and that uh, particular object can still be lying in the eye. So uh, that's important to document very, very. Um, so. Uh, when, when is it that you uh, want to think in terms of repairing of a corneal perforation? So if the perforation is essentially a lamellar perforation, then in those cases you can do away with just a BCL or a BCL with a glue if it's not penetrating through, it's not perforating the cornea, it's just penetrating the cornea about midway through. But in most other cases you have to think in terms of repair and in full thickness uh, injuries you have to always and always repair it. And and there is a decision that you have to take for the rest of the ocular tissues, whether the iris or the vitreous, what has to be done with it. And I'll come to that in another slide at the end. So the only times when you are not repairing, eyes two or three, these are the points that, one, if it is just a lamellar injury, which you can do away with just a, maybe a BCL or a glue, it will going to set on its own. If, on the, if it's, there's a large defect and you need to do a patch graft rather than repair that particular injury, so that's the next important point. And the third is, of course, if the intraocular contents are so far out that you know that this is like an auto-eviscerated eye, in such cases, the idea is not to repair the cornea. There are certain suturing basics that one has to know. We use a 10-0 monofilament nylon suture with a spatulated needle. That's the right or the most appropriate suture to be using for the corneal perforation repairs and one has to before you think in terms of repairing you have to notice note the anatomy that where is it that where is the limbus lying where is the perforation going from so try to get because it has to be put back in its proper anatomical variation in the proper anatomical shape and the 
point of repairs of these corneal perforations is basically first to achieve an integrity of the globe. So that is important and while doing that we have to make sure that we do it in such a way that we can give him the best possible vision outcome. And uh, uh, so I'm quickly going to come to certain forms of repair. The idea for any suture is that in the plane of the suture you actually get the maximum compression and it's and as you go away from the suture, the amount of compression starts to reduce. But there is still some compression around the suture, even if it's not directly in the plane of the suture. The idea, therefore, is they will put sutures at a, at a fixed equidistance to get the maximum uh, or the appropriate compression. Now, there are the way of putting the suture is based on this Rao how technique, which is that in the center, you want to put a sutures which are more superficial and shorter bites as compared to the periphery. Because if you do the same throughout, the cornea is actually going to get flatter in the center. So you want to maintain this shape and the right way of doing it is to put larger, longer bites in the periphery and shorter bites in the center. And of course, equispace the sutures out. It further depends upon whether the particular perforation, is it a perpendicular one or is it an oblique one? So for perpendicular perforations, it's important that the bite is equidistant on both sides of that, uh, the corneal tear. Because if you don't do that, you're going to end up with an overriding tissue which is not what we are wanting at. We are wanting an exact plane to develop. And in, in oblique cases, then you need to make it like this, a shorter bite on the side where the oblique starts and a longer bite on the other side. This keeps it in line, otherwise again there will be overriding. Because here if you follow the principle of keeping it an equal distance bite on either side, then that's not going to work. The tougher ones are of course sometimes the stellate ones. And these stellate ones can be closed in two ways. There are, there are various techniques that are described. But essentially here the idea is to give a compression because one doesn't suture the center of these incisions and one has to suture in jumps around. And here you have to generate further incisions in the cornea using a guarded diamond knife. But generally I tend to prefer this. You got these sutures which are running across and it closes the thing. And you require more compressive forces here to uh, keep the stellate uh, incisions closed. When it, goes, when it goes down to corneoscleral uh, perforations, uh, these are perforations which are going to cross the limbus and they're going to go over to the sclera. And here again, the anatomy is important. And generally, the first thing that's important for us to close is the limbus. So you close the limbus first, then you close the, and the, uh, the far point, wherever there's, let's say there's a turn here, and then you close the intermediate portions. But as a rule, in scleral injuries, when you're doing the repair, you're wanting to go from anterior to posterior. And therefore, the anterior should be done properly. And sometimes to help you out, you can either put bucket handle sutures to pull the globe, or you can hook the muscles. And in case there is a you know, muscle which is in the way, you can disinsert the erectus muscle and then reinsert it back. But go as far back as you possibly can to close these wounds. But it's from the anterior to the posterior. And if it's visible, the entire, the entire wound, then it's better to join it, the limbus, close it at the other end or any turn and then take sutures in between. These we generally are using uh, vicral sutures to do, you can do it with nylon as well. Nylon probably works better. Uh, this is, okay, this is a little decentered down I think. But here what we're looking at uh, is about handling the tissue. So if it is the cornea alone, if it is a lamellar thing, you can let it be also. If it is a penetrating injury, perforating injury of the cornea, you have to repair it. If there is the involvement of the iris, then one has to decide how long has the iris been out. If it's been out more than 24 hours, then you have to excise it. Otherwise, you can reposit it and prolapse it. Of course, if it was a very infected looking wound, it's better to excise than to prolapse it inside. If there is a vitreous prolapse from the wound, in that case, you have to cut the vitreous, you have to do a proper vitrectomy. If there is retina or choroid seems to be coming out, it's better to try and uh, put it back, reposit it back, and then close the wound on top of that. So this is a nutshell are the basic things that one has to do. And I think the take home message here essentially is that the suturing has to be done neatly and in an appropriate manner. And these, then these wounds would good, give good apposition and they'll give good strength as well. 